All right, let's start with an example uh, for both k-means and k-medoids. I'm going to give uh, two examples. As usual, I'm going to use my diabetes data set. So recall that we read the data uh, by using read datum function from in R. And I also have a copy of this data set in my local drive. So I'm going to read this data first. This is nothing but a data frame. If you want to inspect the uh, uh, top of the data frame, we can just see them. Okay, this last column is my class label. But recall that uh, we are not going to use the class label in in uh, in, uh, in clustering uh, because we just assume that we have no idea about the class label, which makes this practice uh, uh, unsupervised learning. Okay, so that's why I'm going to call my k-means function over this data frame by excluding the last column. Yeah, I know that there are like nine columns here. So in R, my indexes are starting from one as opposed to Python. So I'm gonna exclude the ninth column in this case. You could have said, uh, you could have also mentioned the uh, column name when you are, when you are excluding uh, your column. But I just wanted, I just wanted to prefer uh, excluding the column index. Uh, just don't worry about those uh, lines. They were just trying to show something else. Uh, this line actually is talking about k-means clustering. Okay, this is the part of the RV to the k-means clustering. So for this k-means function, if you want to see the details of this function, you can just say question mark k-means and it will give you all the details about your k-means function. And it, will, it, it has a second parameter, which is the number of uh, clusters. So you may want to also include other parameters, which I'm going to skip for the time being. Uh, so this is basically the data set I'm trying to deal with, and this is the number of centers or number of clusters. You can also set the number of iterations, but I'm not going to put any, uh, uh, any, any restrictions on the number of iterations. Therefore, it probably it's going to work with like 10 uh, iterations, okay? So when I do this, when I do this, it will generate an output file, output object, which is called K cluster. So if you wanna inspect this guy, you are gonna see several components of this, all right? So if you wanna inspect, uh, let's say just the centers, K cluster and uh, centers, it, it should give us two vectors. This is the first vector, this is the second vector. And remember, it is an eight dimensional vector. So this is the average of the first class, average of the members of the first class, and this is the average of the members of the second clusters, cluster, I meant cluster. Uh, so uh, let's have a look at this cluster distribution and the class distribution. So normally I have this VAT, that, that, that information from my original data. I would like to just make a comparison between the class labels and the cluster that I discovered to see whether uh, those clusters uh, have any kind of meaning in terms of the class labels. So I'm gonna use the table function here. Uh, you may wanna also look into the details of this table function by typing help and so on. And then I just run this line it gave me like, okay, in the first cluster, it looks like I have like seven or eight negative cases uh, with eight to six positive cases. If you inspect your second cluster, there are like 450 negative cases and 179 positive cases. I cannot really say that this clustering is really a good separation of my, uh, my classes uh, because I would rather want to, I, I, I would rather want to see higher uh, numbers here and there. Yeah, I know this 86 is still greater than 78 and 415 is uh, far more uh, greater than 179, but still I would like to really see this number being more than maybe let's say 100 so that I could say, hey, clustering can actually separate my classes. So that would be a good indication of a good clustering. But for the time being, I don't really uh, think that is a good clustering, okay? And if you want to do some kind of coloring, uh, you can plot this in two dimensional, three dimension. Of course, we cannot go beyond three dimension. In this case, I'm going to visualize this into two dimensions. 
for which I'm going to just select two attributes like plasma level and the body mass index. Um, so this is my original data. Uh, so I'm going to just uh, plot my original data. And then for each data point, I'm going to also pick up a color, uh, uh, which is going to be based on their cluster uh, ID. So I have only two clusters. So there will be like two different colors. When you run this, you are going to find out that, well, there are red data points, which are member of one of one, of one cluster and the other black is uh, from the second cluster. So this was just an experiment on my data, uh, which was called diabetes data set. And now I'm gonna use the iris data set, which is a built-in data set, if you recall. If you wanna remember this data set, you can just say head iris. What you're gonna see is there, there are like five columns. The fifth column is gonna uh, represent the species of the flower. And the remaining four columns, just the length and the width of uh, sepal and petal, uh, components or whatever you call it for the flower for the iris flower and I wanna do a clustering based on these four columns again I'm going to exclude the last column which has the class information so I just wanna pretend like this is not something I am aware of I'll just exclude that to go blind about the class table so I'm gonna run this it will give me it will give you this result. And then I'm gonna do a comparison again, uh, species versus the cluster, meaning I'm going to compare class labels versus cluster IDs to see how this actually worked out. So if you, if you see, it looks like there is some kind of good separation going on here, meaning I have three cluster and the first cluster is mostly populated with Virginica. Second cluster is mostly consisting of Setosa and the third cluster is mostly formed by Versicolor. Looks like, yeah, my separation is much better than my diabetes data set, even though you have some, uh, some samples of Virginica flower which happen to exist uh, in the third cluster. So these are things which can basically tolerate. There is no, I mean, ideal situation. You cannot really purely separate your data points. So that is the nature of data mining, right? So you should not really worry about that. Uh, it, we just uh, try to get the best result that we can achieve. And if you wanna really do the visualization uh, with this, uh, but again, remember I'm using only two attributes. You can try different things, okay? You can, uh, you can basically try and change the attributes to see how they are uh, positioned in the in in in, the, in two dimension. You see, I see most of the red ones and green ones and black ones, which are really well separated, even though you are using two dimension uh, for your data set. So this is a really nice separation, I would say. So this is this black circle is standing out. Other than that, I don't see uh, much problem about the separation of my data. So it looks like without knowing your class label, this algorithm is able to uh, uh, cluster or separate or split your data into the desired number of clusters that you give ahead of time. And let's try to uh, replicate this experiment with uh, the PAM algorithm, remember it was partition around, around uh, Medoids. Instead of using k-means, now I'm going to be using Medoids, right? So to be able to use the, this function, you need to first have the cluster library included. So I'm going to include that library first by calling the library function. So I, I loaded the library first. And then I'm going to do the same thing. Uh, I'm going to try to split this into three clusters. So I run this line and looks like my IRPAM which is also an object, and it can have several components, right? It has the medoids, if you wanna inspect them separately. Uh, so let's type medoids. So again, these are vectors, but these are real data points, be careful. So the, the distinction between k-means and k-medoids is that k-means k -means is gonna uh, show you the average values of the data points in your cluster. On the other hand, k-medoid is 
showing an actual data point from your uh, cluster. So it looks like you have some representative values from those clusters. And now let's look at the performance of this cluster based on the class label. So I'm gonna do the same thing. Looks like I did a better job here. How do I know this? Because Setosa is mostly, uh, 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 mostly uh, formed inside the first cluster. Uh, Virginica is basically forming my second cluster and Versicolor is mostly, except one case, forming my third cluster. So I inspect, I, I see a better clustering in this case based on the class labels. So I can probably conclude that K-Medoid is doing maybe better than K-means in this scenario. And that is something you would also expect maybe uh, because remember K-means had some disadvantages like it was, it was sensitive to outliers and there were other things you need to consider about K-means. So if you wanna again visualize this, you see uh, based on these two attributes, this is the visualization. Like the earlier case, I would like to change this to petal width to, to be consistent about my visualization. And uh, okay, let me draw this. I think this is not really, okay, this is not the right one, I guess. So let me delete this. Let me get rid of all the images. It might be, okay, let me do this one more time. So I'm gonna plot my, <clears throat> uh, data points. Okay, this is sepal with, okay, I think we did something wrong here. Okay, let me get rid of this one more time. Let me use this guy. This will be a better visualization, see. Let's move, what's going on here? Let me change this one. First we have to draw the points, uh, plots, and then, okay, let me make them. Uh, consistent with each other. So I'm gonna draw a scatter plot first. This is my plot. Okay, yeah. Uh, again, I'm using my um, earlier one. And now I would like to put my uh, medoids. So you see these diamonds are, these diamond shapes are actual data members and they are my medoids and I just use two attribute to uh, have them represented or have them drawn in the, in the figure. In the earlier case, I used this guy to show you, oh, okay, these are my uh, cluster means. It was the idea. Okay, let me get rid of this figure one more time. So I'm gonna show you something else. Let me clear this command line. And this time I'm gonna introduce a data set, which is a toy data set. It has only like, maybe like 10 rows. And this is the uh, data set I use my, in my lecture notes. So I have like two, two, six, three, four, three, eight. And then I ran my algorithm to discover two clusters. And it looks like I have two clusters and I would like to do the same visualization with these data points. So these are the data points that you might remember from our lecture notes. And finally, I'm going to show you that, hey, this is the medoid for this cluster and that is the medoid for this cluster. Yeah, you, you see it is not really centrally located here uh, because I need to select an actual data point, not, a, not the average of these four points. In that case, I would say this would be the centroid of the uh, cluster. But in this case, since I have to stick to what? The actual data points, I have to select one over other ones. Uh, finally, let's do the following exercise. I'm gonna normalize my data and I'm gonna see how it works out. So for this reason, I'm gonna exclude the last column. Uh, I wanna work with the remaining columns and I, I'll make a copy of this. You don't have to do this, but uh, it is just an extra thing that I would like to go through. Again, here what I do is the z-score normalization, meaning for, from each value I subtract the uh, 
average and divide by the standard deviation of the values for each, I do this for each column basically. Uh, you could have called a function which was built in to do the same thing, but I also wanted to show you how the process actually goes through. So Z score is something that you may, that you may want to apply. You can also have the mean max normalization, that's also okay. And suppose I would like to get two clusters again one more time. So I run my k-means algorithm and then uh, I can use the same uh, same command that I used here for the k-means to uh, show that how this cluster and the class labels agree with each other after this clustering. Okay, so I want to run this one more time. <clears throat> So for the for the diabetes data set, so I have some, I have more, uh, again, it is pretty much trying to locate the negative ones in the second cluster, and it is trying to put the positive ones, mostly positive ones to the first cluster, but still it is not really ideal. Okay. So, the class table. Okay, so let's try to replicate this experiment with K do it one more time. And I want to table this. And I would like to make a neck to neck comparison. But you see, in this case, uh, K do it doesn't seem to perform uh, much better than the other ones, uh, K means. So if you try to compare this one, okay, negative ones, it was like 125 in the first one. Uh, in this case, it is 162. Actually, k it we can say k it did worse than k-means because uh, majority of the uh, negative ones are uh, kind of occupying uh, both of the clusters. So if you just look into each individual cluster, think about the first cluster, you have mostly negative ones. When you look at the second cluster, what you discover is that mostly the data members are coming from the negative class. So it is not really uh, showing a good uh, separation of your data, I would say. Okay. Um, again, if you go to your iris data set, and if you want to replicate these experiments by yourself, uh, it might be more explanatory. And also, you may want to do the toy data set by yourself to, to see that how the meadows are being selected for a given uh, for a given cluster. <clears throat>